around hair, right? We talked about bacteria and eukarya, um, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, and generally speaking. But yeah, so as we begin to talk about these, um, let's just quickly review a couple of important things from our earlier part. So what's the difference between bright field and dark field microscopy? Okay, so for stickers, now we'll do the right way. So raise your hand and we'll talk. The bright field versus dark field. Yes. The light that's not going to show to the moon is being reflected. Uh huh. And, and for the dark light field, it is just giving you like a, it's less direct and it's like. What happens to the light that doesn't go through the specimen in a dark field? It's reflected off of a picture. Okay. So does it become part of the picture or no? What do you see? It's not. It's not. Good. So, you, and you can steal the job. So, in a light, you know, in a bright field, so if you're, this is the stage where your specimen is, right, and you have your light, all the light in through is going to be detected up above. And so you'll be seeing everything in the image, including the space around it as light. But in a dark field, you are going to have, you know, your stage again, your specimen, and this is where if you're when you're detecting the image, only the light that goes through your image is going to be detected. Everything else will actually bounce away. So everything else is going to be dark. Only your specimen is going to be lit up, and that's what allows you to have a little bit of contrast, right? Okay. Um, What's the difference between our light microscopy versus electron uh, microscopy or electron transmission microscopy? Yes. And then like the light one. <laughs> right? So <laughs> but you know. That's not it. Yeah. Can you repeat what you asked? What was the question? So I asked, what's the difference between like, you know, electron microscopy or transmission microscopy versus the simple light microscopy? Uh -huh. There's the difference that with light microscopy, like you're just seeing what's on the slide with the light versus like with the electron. Like the electrons are being bounced off of the specimen and then like being copied somewhere else. It's showing like a three image. It's trying. Um, light microscopy, you're able to see what the cell contains. Well, in dark, well, in the other one, you would see the structure. You can see the structure in light too. It depends on what type of specimen you have. So you're the closest one right now. Um, yes. Um, so the light microscopy, the light shines from the bottom to the top, so you can observe it. And the electron microscopy, the electrons shine down. So you can have light microscopy types where you are having the light coming from the top versus the bottom, actually. You have inverted microscopes as well, but you are all, you two are similar level. I'll have you try one more time. So I was gonna add something else that I didn't say. So with is it with like electrons, you can see like a bigger specimen, so it doesn't have to be like a cross section. So I think you guys are making it more complicated than it is. <laughs> yes. Within the cell for the um, transmission, the electron, my scrap. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I think the fact that you phrase transmission electron microscopy may be what's tripping you up, but that's a good practice for quick questions. Yes, go ahead. You didn't finish. You started. Sorry, I'm like <laughs> not awake right now. Me either. No, are you awake? Oh. The electron microscopy just shows the detail like within the cell like of the organelles. I can get that with light. Did you have something? Yeah, I was going to say uh, electron microscopy has way shorter wavelengths, which gives a higher resolution to the picture. Why does it have way shorter wavelength? It's like the most Be basic difference between the two, by the way. 
because um, it shines from like the side of the microscope. Mm, no. <laughs> yeah, because it has a beam of electrons that go. Yes, more so than a light microscopy, it's a light. Yes, that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> this is a how people use it. Oh, it's a beam of light uh, in a light microscopy. It's a beam of electrons in electron microscopy. Yeah. Um, next, let's come um, within the prokaryotes. Let's talk about differences between bacteria and archaea. <laughs> We only talked about a couple of them yet, but yes. Um, I think one of the main differences is that archaea can live in hostile environments. That is correct. Archaea can live in hostile environments. It's a very easy sticker. I like them to be a little more hard, but I'll get it. I'm still being nice the first few weeks or days. Um, what What's another difference? Yes? Um, archaea is actually closer to eukaryotes than it is to bacteria. They are closer to eukaryotes than they are to bacteria. Although, you know, it's a different. I have a, a different view on that. <laughs> but they're, they're equidistant in some cases. But yes. Okay. That is correct. And so their membranes are actually different in composition because of that. And they have fatty acid chains in your typical bacteria. These are isoprene chains in archaea. Um, so that's an, um, something you can add on to it. Another some, uh, cool part that we did talk about, right, in a bacterial uh, membranes versus archaea membranes, where that there are some archaea uh, bacteria that are that have a single layer, not a bilayer, right? Because they have some you know, hydrophilic heads on both ends and just a single layer making up their structure, which is super cool. Um, another part that I did not mention last time and I wanted you to be aware of was that uh, to date, there are no archaea that have been found to infect humans. However, there are plenty of bacteria that you can get diseases from. Okay, so now we were talking about eukaryotes. And eukaryotes as a class, the biggest difference there is what between them and the prokaryotes? Yes. Membrane-bound organelles. Membrane-bound organelles. What else? Um, eukaryotes have a contained nucleus. They have a contained nucleus to keep them happy. All the DNA very protected within them. So that is correct. Um, and then we are going to be going through those different membrane-bound organelles today to begin with, to start off our discussion. Oh, I had a clicker. What did I do with it? <laughs> Come on, I was, um, was going to test it out. I brought it from home. Because the one here tends to disappear very quickly. Let's see if it works. Okay. Yeah, that's bad. Okay. Why do you need it's okay. it? It's nice. No. I still have to do this. You change slides. <laughs> so um, we started off with the nucleus as the center holding all our information, right? Inside it, um, a difference between typical membranes and the nuclear membrane is that the nuclear membrane is what? What was special? We did talk about that as we left yesterday. It is a double bilayer. Double. It's a double bilayer. That's right. And we'll later on talk about how that might have happened over the course of evolution, uh, evolutionary time. But yes, it's a double bilayer. And then you have the DNA housed inside it. Is the DNA present in the form of chromosomes all the time or no? No, what is it present as? Fragments of DNA? I really hope not. By the way, just for its sake and mine, this is not yours, right? I'm gonna take these away so you don't. 
guys have more space. Um, what is it contained as? Protein. DNA is contained as proteins. Ooh, that sounds like fun. <laughs> I hope that yes, it's not contained as chromosomes all the time. Now the individual linear pieces are there, but they are in their decondensed form, and so they are going to be just kind of long strings, right? That are wrapped around proteins called histones, like yo-yos. We'll talk about those a lot next week, and then they are all packed in tightly within the nucleus. Now, it's not just packed randomly in there. It's packed in specific places. They have a place to go. They have a home in each case. In addition to that, um, inside the nucleus, you'll also have nucleoli, which have their own function, uh, as we will see later on. So you can see nuclei in various stages of cell division or in uh, over the course of the life cycle of a cell. Sometimes you'll have them in a condensed form. Other times you'll just have the chromatin, as it is called in its decondensed form, hanging out inside the nucleus. Next one that we started to talk about was mitochondria. Uh, again, these are electron micrographs, so that's why you can see such great detail inside them. Uh, is the light okay, or would you prefer a lower light? Turn it off. Turn it off? Yeah, we can't really see. Whoever is back there, can you switch them up, please? There we go. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Kind of, sort of? I don't know about these two, but um, we'll deal with it. I feel like it's better, but also very ambient. So I hope I don't put people to sleep. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. But um, the mitochondria actually has a lot of membranes in vaccination within it, creating these little compartmental structures. Um, so it has multiple membrane structures. It has an inner membrane, it has an outer membrane, and then it has the little matrix inside that is you very useful in energy production. It's a little power plant inside our cells. Not every cell will have the same number of mitochondria, right? And you can over your lifetime too. So just because you started with, let's say, five mitochondria cell doesn't mean that's the case always. When you exercise and you're actually actively working on your cardiovascular health, you increase the number of mitochondria within each cell. And that's partly how you get your ability to, you know, and your endurance, right? And when you are not well and you are not exercising and laying down like I was, then you lose some of those and you're not able to process the energy as quickly and thus you're unable to then maintain that health either. Right, so it goes both ways. I wish the clicker was working. I guess next time, each time we'll get a little bit better. Um, again, if you were a plant cell, then you would have additional ways for you to uh, prepare energy from food, right? Uh, and in that case, chloroplasts are the organelles that are present in plants or in photosynthetic things. Uh, and these chloroplasts uh, contain chlorophyll containing membranes. Again, it's very similar in some ways to how mitochondria functions, except this can also capture energy from sunlight and use that as well. So this one has, uh, again, multiple layers of membranes, right? It has these stacks of membranes in this case inside its uh, structure that help it do its job that it needs to do in capturing sunlight with the chlorophyll and then using it to make energy, make glucose and then breaking down to make energy. So one uh, possible theory is that mitochondria and uh, chloroplast, you know, uh, most likely evolved. So that's a hypothesis that we've been working with, uh, most likely uh, evolved over the course of time with the uh, uh, bacteria getting engulfed by the larger or, uh, cells that were, so to speak, there. And as they got engulfed, instead of getting digested, they became part of the system. So kind of like a symbiotic relationship initially, and then later on became a permanent part as they changed more and more. 
So in this case, you can imagine a prokaryotic cell um, that exists in an environment and some aerobic bacteria that are in the system uh, that it is ingesting for food, right, to uh, eat. But in this case, that aerobic bacteria stuck around and gave this prokaryote another ability, right? So now uh, this prokaryote is able to do additional things. It can now process oxygen and it can make ATP, right? So because of the presence of aerobic uh, bacteria within it. Over a long period of time, they would eventually lose some of their autonomy because now they're part of the symbiotic relationship. They don't need certain functions anymore and become what we now call mitochondria. Similarly, in uh, the chloroplast example, you would have had to have already a cell that contained mitochondria or mitochondria-like structure producing energy using oxygen. And then, so this would have been a further down the line evolution. Um, some of these primitive cyanobacteria may have uh, gotten in. Uh, so they would have ingested, uh, been ingested by these early animal cells. And now that would have given them additional capability by using um, sun for energy source because they had the photosynthetic pigments within them. And that would have given rise over a very, very, very long time to what we now call our new plant cells, right? So this is um, the most likely scenario that could have happened uh, in this case, because there are a lot of there. If we look at the genomes from cyanobacteria, from early uh, aerobic bacteria, you can see a lot of similarities in that and the mitochondrial and the genome or the genome that you see in the chloroplast it's essentially you can line them up and see many of those things still present within them. Um, where there are differences are where they've lost certain genes, most likely that was giving them autonomy to be their own thing. Okay, and that leads us into animal versus plant cells, the two main types of cells that you see in eukaryotic world. Um, again, one of the big difference between animal versus plant cell is whether they have these photosynthetic chloroplasts or not, right? Chloroplasts are going to be seen in your plant cells, while animal cells will typically not have them. Another big difference between an animal versus plant cell is the presence of a, a cell wall a structure that kind of gives it a little bit more stability and control on its shape and size. And that is specific to plant cells. It also acts as a protective barrier, right? So they can kind of go through a little bit more. They're more resilient to things around them, environmental changes before they die out because of it. Animal cells do not have that, uh, which allows them to be more motile and have a little bit more flexibility but also leaves them a little bit more open to the surrounding, um, you know, whatever things are happening around them. Both animal and plant cells will contain a central command center nucleus with the DNA inside it. They will both contain mitochondria that are going to provide them with a way to process energy. That's gonna be for both of them. Um, now, a lot of the other stuff that is present, again, is going to be present in both. So both of them will contain these membrane structures, membrane roadways all along the uh, inner side of the cell, typically around the nucleus called endoplasmic reticulum, that are the processing center for protein synthesis and protein processing to other places, kind of tagging them for where they need to go. Yes, question? Um, I can't remember. Is the central vacuole, is that only in plant? Central vacuole is only going to be in plant. That is not to say there are no vacuoles in animal cells, but they are going to be typically smaller. And depending on the cell type, some will only have a couple, some will have a lot of them. That is specific to plant cell, that large central vacuole. Uh, again, doesn't have to be right in the center, right? But what that helps the plant cell do is balance its water amount and uh, kind of maintains its turgidity. So uh, it is going to make sure that it doesn't get so much water that it bursts out or, you know, it just kind of balances those things out and balances the electrolytes inside the plant cell. 
Um, then uh, all of them, both of them structurally inside, that structure is going to be maintained through microtubules, through other cytoskeletal structures, actin filaments, and we'll talk plenty about those later in the semester. And uh, both those, and not just those, actually, even bacteria will contain ribosomes that are going to be synthesizing proteins. And that's going to be constant throughout life uh, system. Any questions about these two for now? No. Their cell division is going to be a little bit different, right, when we get to the cell division portion. Um, and then uh, there are going to be certain things about the way uh, you set those microtubules out in the process that are going to be different. But there are a lot of uh, overlap between the two as well. So going on to the next one, what we were just talking about, the endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum is really cool in that some of it is going to be connected. These are just membranes, right? These are membranes with a little bit of space between them. Um, they're kind of membranes folded on top of each other, right? And with spaces between them where specialized tasks can happen in a specialized environment, essentially. So you are going to have some that are going to be directly connected to the nucleus, a nuclear membrane, as you can see, right? So it's kind of almost like an extension of it. Uh, and others that are going to be around in that space, taking over other, it's probably taking over the largest area within the cell outside of the central vacuole in the uh, plant cell. And these are the sites a lot of times for assembly of cell membrane components, whether they may be proteins or lipids that are going to be eventually part of it. It's also going to be places where you're going to be tagging them for specific delivery, right? Kind of like a little post office. So it's gonna be uh, making sure things are going to the right places. Um, and so here you can see in this particular part, what we call rough endoplasmic reticulum. Anyone know the difference between rough endoplasmic reticulum and smooth? New person. The rough has ribosomes on it and the smooth doesn't. Exactly. So the basic difference between the rough endoplasmic reticulum versus the smooth is that the rough, and this is the rough, you can see those little dots studded all along the endoplasmic reticulum outer surface. Those are actual ribosomes sitting on the endoplasmic reticulum. And what they do is that these are the sites for protein synthesis, which are going to then take, as the protein is getting made, they're going to be dumping them directly into the ER. And those proteins are the ones that need to go somewhere. They just can't stay around in the cytoplasm. They have somewhere else to go, so they need to be tagged for it and travel to that place. As opposed to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is going to be site for lipid membrane components and other types of structural spaces. You know, Those things are gonna be built there as opposed to what's getting done here. This is gonna be more for your protein synthesis. Make sense? Yay, it worked. How come? <laughs> Dying to madness. Maybe just needed a minute to talk to the computer. Woohoo. Okay. So next, we get to the next part. Now that the protein or a, a structural component has been built, it needs to be transferred there. And that job is done by Golgi apparatus. It takes those initial structures and proteins that are already built inside the ER. It um, is then takes them and it sometimes has to modify them to complete finish, you know, finish the process of them so that they're completely final, uh, present in their final product. And then it's going to transfer them. It's essentially going to move them along. It's like your little FedEx Express, right? Service. So it's going to go from one station to the next, to the next, to the next, and eventually go into these little delivery trucks, vesicles that are going to take them where they need to go at the end. This is especially important in proteins that are secreted, membrane proteins, membrane components themselves. Those are all carried through this Golgi apparatus and they kind of walk over, uh, they get uh, sorted, they get modified, and then eventually go into these vesicles out to where they need to go. Um, in the case of membrane components, they will merge with that part of the membrane. In case of secretion, they are going to go into the membrane 
and then the vesicle is going to get thrown outside where the proteins are then going to be expelled. Um, so that's how these move. Many times from the ER also, you can have vesicles that are taking them from the ER to the Golgi, and then from Golgi, they're going to be vesicles that are going to be taking them away from that space. Next, you have your cytoskeletal structures. Uh, these are responsible not only for cell to have a very specific directed cell movement, but also maintain the cell shape and size and its structure. Uh, there are three different types of uh, cytoskeletal structures, main structures that we're going to be talking about. Microtubules, microfilaments are some of them, right? Here you have each one of them um, labeled in a separate way. So you have microtubule structures, you have actin filaments, right? Um, you have microfilaments, so you have different types of structures that are going to be part of that cytoskeletal structure. Uh, again, here, what type of microscopy is used in these images? Mm -hmm. Fluorescent microscopy. And how come they are, how come we know which one is which? How are they differentially stained? What do they use? Fluorescent dyes. Fluorescent dyes. But how does the fluorescent dye know that it only has to bind to the actin or only to the microtubules? Where are you? Antibodies. You got it. So yes, yeah, so, oh, it does look like antibody too. <laughs> <laughs> By accident. <laughs> so um, yes, antibodies fused with a specific, elect you know, Alexa floor or some kind of a fluorescent dye is what is used to tag different types of cytoskeletal structures. Um, and that's how we can then monitor them. And that's again, one of the really cool applications of uh, this type of microscopy. How do we know where the nucleus is? So in this one, the nucleus is just like not stained, right? So that's easy. Um, but here it is stained in blue. So what's staining it blue? Anyone remember the dye we talked specifically? Each and E is not fluorescent. It starts with an R. No. <laughs> Sorry. B. You don't get another sticker for that though. But <laughs> sorry. B A P I. Uh, it's the dye that typically we use for this. That what did you say the uh, dye started with? R? No, that's different. I thought maybe you were talking about another dye. Another dye that we can use to fluorescently label the nucleus is called propidium iodide. This is something that we use a lot when we're doing cell cycle analysis. With nucleus, uh, nuclear DNA with propidium iodide. We run it through a system, right, through a scanner. Each cell, as it scans through, it's going to monitor how much fluorescence is coming out of it. So what you're going to get are, you know, once you normalize it and everything, in a typical cell culture, right, or in a particular environment of cells, you just have all these cells going through, you will get typically a peak at what you would call essentially 2N at that point. And then you'll have some things in the middle and then exactly about twice as much fluorescence, you are going to have another peak. So these, what can you think about what these cells might be in these two populations? So I've already given you kind of a clue in that we call the first peak 2N and the second one 4N. You can talk to your partners. It is a bit, this is a metaphase. Yeah. Can you? So I'm talking about, so in this fax, it's called fax analysis, fluorescence assisted cell sorting. And when you sort the cells, you can get some at a particular fluorescence amount. Then you get some minor amounts in the, the middle typically. And then you have a second smaller peak at exactly twice the amount of fluorescence. What are these two peaks 
referring to? Somebody had a hands up. Oh, I was going to ask you. Oh, OK. Perfect. Um, so uh, let's think about it. How much DNA? Uh, so what happens to DNA as we go through cell cycle? It is not, but very interesting guess. Good guess. It could be yes. that idea, right? Okay. So keep that idea in your head and think about it some more. Yes, back there. Is it paired and unpaired? It is what? A paired and unpaired. I'm going to come and listen to you. <laughs> like paired and unpaired. Paired and unpaired chromosome. That's, again, a very close. You're almost there. You're on the right track. So think about a cell as it's going through cell cycle, right? And it's getting ready to divide and then it eventually divides. What happens to the DNA inside as it gets ready to divide? It duplicates. So you have the same amount of DNA, yeah. you double the DNA, half the DNA. So Suddenly you have double the DNA, right? And so, and when we talk about actual cell cycle, and I'm so sorry that you can't really see this over there that well, this first large number of cells are what we call just like hanging out cells in G0, or they are cells that are not yet dividing, not yet in the cell cycle doing things towards it. These cells in the middle that are somewhere between 2N and 4N are cells that are going through the synthesis phase or the S phase. And then the cells on this side of the equation are ones that are either ready to divide or actively dividing going through mitosis, G2 to M. So this technique called fax analysis, and again, we'll learn a lot more about that in a couple of weeks or in a week, um, helps you figure out what percentage of your given cell culture or your given system is actively dividing at any given time, um, going through the process of synthesis and just kind of hanging out. Make sense? Okay. Somebody had said the double the DNA. You get one because you're right. <laughs> you said double the DNA, right? Yeah. I saw it. Oh. You I said mean, it too. I did. I just said it quietly. Oh. But next time, say it. <laughs> So yes, yeah, so microtubules are what are going to help us segregate the chromosomes in a dividing animal cell. So you are going to have, uh, this is again, one particular type of your cytoskeletal structure. Um, and they help all the chromosomes line up perfectly in that metaphase plate and then divide. And that's true for both plant and animal cell, right? It's just gonna go through different steps later on because of the presence and absence of cell wall. But those chromosomes line up, look how beautifully they line up on these microtubules. Each one is gonna hold on to one and make sure that they are divided properly during that cell division. Um, so now, again, we talked about how important these membranes are, right? The membranes uh, contain these different departments, right? Different kind of little, the organelles essentially act like departments for specific functions internally, but they are also ways for our cells to interact with the environment. They can take in things through invagination of membranes within through a process called endocytosis. When they do that, these internal vesicles, right, uh, are going to create these endosomes that will then hold on to that material and process it further for the cell use or for the cell to interact with. Similarly, on the other end, the Golgi apparatus is going to have vesicles bud off that are going to then go and merge with the membrane to release the contents to the outside world in order to have some effect there, right? So our cells are communicating with each other as well as with the environment through these structures, through the endosomes where they take in the environmental stimuli and through the you know, exosomes on the other end that are releasing signals to the environment to try to get it to do what they want to do or do it respond to the environment in some way. An example of this is a cancer cell, for example, or even you know a rapidly growing organ 
as it needs more blood supply, it may be secreting uh, specific growth factors to help the blood vessels know that they need to have more blood supply towards them. And that's gonna cause what we call neoangiogenesis, new blood vessels to form towards the area where these signals are coming from. So that's an example of how the system would use their signals to interact with the environment. Cool. Questions? Similarly, they can pick up growth hormones. They can pick up differentiation factors. They can pick up other signals from outside, right? Our um, systems release hormones all the time that are the endocrine system will release these hormones, they'll be in the bloodstream, they're gonna go into the cell using similar mechanisms many times, and then have an effect on that cell's biology in response. Uh, finally, for this part, we are gonna talk about model organisms that we use in our molecular biology uh, study. But this actually, a lot of these are also used by biochemists as well as developmental biologists as well. Um, Molecular biology, uh, uh, folks, we love working with E. coli. Again, that's a bacterial system because it's very easy to use, very simple to use. We know the entire genome. We can control it, right? We can add genes to it. We can subtract genes from it. We can make it our factory for proteins of interest that we have. So we can have a human gene. We can insert it and tell it, can you make a lot of it for me so I can use it for my analyses? And it will do so. So that's a cool part of that. Sometimes using E. coli itself is not enough. We need to go a little bit further and have uh, some of those specific changes that are specific to eukaryotic uh, organisms be preserved. In that case, brewer's yeast is the next one that we use, right? Um, and that's again, a simple eukaryote that will maintain all those chemical changes and structures that are specific to eukaryotes. And we'll talk about some of those modifications later. Um, for plants, we love doing um, Arabidopsis. And then for other studies, more complicated studies, we would use flies, worms, fish, and mice. So I am, uh, we very rarely study directly the humans, right? But we do have to study humans themselves. Mostly when we are studying humans, we are working with cell culture like you will do in the lab for this course. So here it is again. Uh, e. coli are used primarily because of their simplicity and their high growth rate, and because of the fact that we can easily transfect them with genomes of our choice and we can have them be used for our purposes. So that is a very common application of E. coli. Again, Borosis is also used because it is um, a simple eukaryote. They have many conserved pathways with humans, with other more complex eukaryotes. So especially, you know, you will actually notice and the new kind of uh, Nobel prizes are gonna be uh, out soon as well. You will notice if you go in history and look at that majority of the Nobel prizes are actually given two people working on simple systems rather than more complex, because you can actually get very meaningful information and data very quickly from these organisms because of their simplicity, because you know their entire genome, their short lifespan. So I can create millions of them to study instead of just looking at five humans, right? So you can get a lot more numbers. You can get a lot more information, um, especially for all these conserved pathways to make meaningful conclusions that can be applied to humans down the road. So um, that is something cool to be aware of. Um, when we are considering what organism we wanna use, there are a few things that we have to keep in mind, right? We have to think about. The first one is ease of use based on not just our expertise, but how much money we have available, what supplies we are going to need and how easily they'll be available and how much space that model organism is going to require to do the work that we want it to do, right, at the end of the day. Um, so if we need to grow six generations of flies, how much space do I need for it? Um, or I need six generations worth of data. Which model organism can I use based on its lifespan, based on its time to maturity, all that good stuff, right? Uh, so this is the second one that we want to have something that has a relatively short life cycle 
and time to maturity. So I can get more cycles out of it. I can get larger data. And then that is going to relate to directly how good of a conclusion I can make from it. Um, next, you want to look at how many offsprings do you get per cycle? If you're just going to get one human each cycle, that may not really relate to a lot of numbers, right? But with flies, with uh, E. coli, you know, not the C. elegans, sorry, with zebra fish, you can get lots and lots of progeny. You can get lots of numbers, and then that would translate to better data, better conclusions. Um, for more complex, obviously, you have mice and humans. Mice, again, you still get significant number of progeny per litter, so you still get some data there as well. With humans, it's better to do epidemiological studies when you need large number of data, you know, participants, rather than trying to do any other way. Um, and you can control them, right? You can control these other in a lab environment. You Even when you have somebody in a clinical trial, clinical study, I was in a clinical trial. I kept my diary very well, but I know how detailed they want you to be. It's very hard for a normal layperson to do that all the time. For me, it was interesting because I'm in science and I run my own clinical trials. So it was just like, you know, my own lab notebook going on. But that's not going to be the case for everyone. And when you're not feeling good, that's the last thing you want to do. Um, so that is something to be mindful of when you're using humans versus other model organisms. Next, you want something that's easily manipulated. That don't mean emotionally. I just mean like actual genetically. I want to make sure that I can change its genome when I want, right? In every single cell of its body if I need. And I can look at the effect down the road. You can do that with C. elegans uh, very, very easily. We know every single cell, when it develops, how it develops in that uh, you know, system. And we can change it at a very early time and watch it develop over time and see what happens. We can look at every single gene in C. elegans. Similarly for Drosophila, we have so many different mutants available, so much information available. Genetically, it's a great model organism for that purpose. Um, zebrafish is a newer model system, but it also is getting more and more things available to us. We have the entire genome. We have, at this time, a lot of uh, different mutations available already, so easy to study again. Uh, mice, a little bit more difficult, right? If you want to make a new mutation that doesn't exist, it's going to be a two-year process. It's going to take a bit. You can just like to wake up today and start your experiments tomorrow. So can be, you know, hard to do. This one ain't happening. So <laughs> sorry. Can't yeah, happen. I'm just gonna, that's gonna be your project for life then. That's it. One. So at the end of the day, because humans are not gonna be a very viable option in many cases, you wanna make sure that what you have available is going to be relatable to the human condition that you are trying to study. And that's extremely important that you look at that conservation of that system at that time for the one that you're looking at. And based on that, you know, just because, uh, you know, uh, I'm interested in a particular model organism doesn't mean it's appropriate for every single experiment that I try. Sometimes you have a project, you have a condition you're studying where C. elegans might be a better option and you have to switch around and you have to change your you know, labs focus to get the data that you need or make a collaboration with somebody who can do that for you. Um, so since humans directly cannot be studied, we have to go to the next best thing. So we, a lot of our studies nowadays are what we call in vitro studies. That means that they are outside the typical body, right, from that organism. Instead, they are grown in lab in culture setting. And in vitro studies use cells from normal diseased, you know, or, or uh, from cancer with or without drugs, whatever you may want, those cells in culture, and they observe them and they look at their genetics and they look at the changes that happen with them. So in vitro is, you know, in uh, if you just directly translate it, it means in glass experiment using cultured cells. But uh, in reality, it's basically something that's done in the lab with the living cell. It cannot just be in a test tube, which is a biochemical test. In vivo, on the other hand, is in the living. When you do experiments on the full organism intact as it is. So if I'm working with flies themselves, it's going to be in vivo. 
or if I'm working with a mouse and putting a cancer cell in them and seeing if they make tumors or not, that's in vivo. But when I have cells in culture from the liver of the mouse and I'm treating it with drugs and seeing what happens if it creates a cancerous phenotype, that's in vitro. And finally, a third type is in silico. When you're looking at large databases or when you're doing a computer simulation and using the information available on the computer to make your conclusions, to analyze and compete. Questions so far for this first lecture before we move forward. Oh, here. Just to give a minute. And we shall start with the second one. Um, yes. On the board, is that a Q to him? Where? I think it's a G. Oh, oh, it's a G. <laughs> it's a G view. G1, G2. It still looks like a Q. I am so sorry. G2. There, there we go. go. We got it. Any other questions? That was a fun question, though. Correct. Um, for a second before we go to the next one. For the next one, we're going to just start off uh, with the first part before we leave for today. I think we've got a scanning portion uh, of what the DNA is made of, and then we'll continue it next time with the more detailed. That's a good. Thank you. up. Relax. Chilling. You're chilling. Sounds good. Let me know when I go too fast so I can slow down. A lot of stuff that now is still kind of halfway review, so it should be okay. Uh -huh. Is this the same as the lecture that's online? Yes. Yep. Um, I updated the module page for the first lecture to include that link for microscopy that I talked about. And it also, I believe I also added a little thing about archaea and bacteria. Otherwise, it's going to be the announcement this week. But I know I added the microscopy link to it. <laughs> but yeah, the lecture is the same. Um, the yeah, other one was other YouTube videos that you have to Which you have? Or no? Which chapter? Chapter. This one or the one? The one that I talked about? Yeah. Or no? Yeah, there's plenty of stuff online. Well, they on Canvas. The ones that I put on Canvas are my own, I think. No, I do put others, other people's on there as well. But in the very first module, there is uh, in that first like blurb that I have about what we're doing this week, there is a link to my own YouTube videos from when I taught it through Zoom. So when you teach it in person, it goes differently than when you're doing it in, on Zoom, right? Because nobody talks to you on Zoom. So you just kind of do your spiel like you're talking to the wall and walk away. But sometimes that's helpful for review purposes for people. So I have that link there. And then um, there are times that I'm going to have other people's lectures. So there are a couple of great folks. One of them, well, actually two of them, Nobel laureates, and uh, one that was my own cell biology teacher from back in the day when I was at Emory. Um, and I saw his like lecture series online and I was like, because I love him so much. Oh my goodness. I could sit in his class and listen to him all day long. And so he's amazing. I can't teach like that. But um, so I have his lectures every now and then to supplement or to review what I've talked about. And the MIT folks, there's some signaling lectures. Uh, I have a couple from there um, that you will get that are already embedded. So you will actually be able to click on those directly. For what I'm doing today, um, Eric Lander 
who is also a Nobel laureate, he had some lectures online yeah. where you just, again, want to just sit there and listen and enjoy. Um, so you can look him up in his uh, lectures from, I believe he's on the But if you do Eric Lander DNA lecture, it should pop up. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we ready? Important. Important. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see it's giving me a new one. Well, we have plenty of So, are you posting these Zooms? Or are you just. These Zooms? Yeah, I like your own Zoom. This, what I'm just recording? That's my my goal was to have them as well because again, like I said, it's a different vibe when you're doing it in person versus when you're doing it online. So usually these are more entertaining. Um, the my recording the other day because my mic was broken and mm -hmm. it wasn't the best. I still looked at it and I will post it so you can see it. Right, if you li uh, like, you can. Um, you can definitely hear me, but it's or just not the quality that I like. So I'm trying something different today. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. I recorded something with it on my desk yesterday, but then of course it's going to turn out good when you're sitting on your desk <laughs> versus uh, when you're in a classroom. So I'll say this is the first time I'm trying it. Okay. Brand new one. So we'll... Okay. So now, as I said, that this time, um, the way the schedule worked out, I reorganized my uh, labs. And then uh, because of the labs, I also reorganized the lecture uh, because of all the like little fall break here and the Veterans Day and the Labor Day and possible hurricanes, right? You have to like take into account all the possible scenarios. It just was working out better to have DNA first, which is a sad way to say it. I actually like it when I go from membrane in. <laughs> Uh, so again, this is the first time that I'm going to go in to out from starting at the nucleus. But of course, you know, I still made sure that it made sense to me as a workflow. So hopefully it will make sense to you as well. So we're going to start out in the command center inside the nucleus. And we're going to talk about DNA and chromosomes and what role they play in our cell life and in us and, you know, as an organism. And then we'll continue moving one step out each time and finally get to the membrane. <laughs> cool. So DNA, this particular chapter. Now the chapter five that's listed here is from Alberts. If you look in the schedule, it tells you the work from lecture uh, chapter that pertains to DNA mm. structure. They go pretty much the same way. Actually, Bertram is even better because it has just a chapter for structure, just a chapter for transcription, translation, replication. There are like four different chapters versus two in uh, Albert. So I love the way Bertram is organized for that. And so that's what I would look at for it. Um, so today, you know, or for this chapter specifically, we're going to be focusing on the general structure of DNA. Then we're going to talk about how the DNA comes together to form the chromosomes. And then we're going to look at finally how that chromosome structure is regulated so that a cell knows when to express what genes and have what function performed. Okay, so, um, you know, we didn't always know how genetic material um, was made or what exactly was the genetic material. At various parts, uh, times in the, you know, history, it had been that, oh, it's the proteins that are the genetic material or something else that's the genetic material. It was, you know, nucleic acid was an option, but it wasn't really uh, until much later that it was actually <clears throat> thought that it was it. So Mendel, obviously, long time before DNA was ever discovered, did talk about the existence of genes, that there must have been something there, but he didn't know what they were made of, right? He didn't know where they were coming from, but obviously he knew there was something heritable inside. And that was the basic point that everyone was looking for. What is it that is giving us this heritable trait and how is it getting passed on from one place to another? Measure is study nuclein from pus. So, you know, he looked at the pus and he looked at what he found in there. Now, remember, at that time, microscopy is not microscopy today. 
So what you're looking at are general cell bodies, probably, right? You're just looking at the membranes and something inside. And so he thought that was it. That was the nucleon that was containing the DNA or uh, containing the heritable structure. But um, initially, he actually thought it was DNA. But then he changed his mind and he said, no, these cells are the heritable structures when that wasn't the case. Um, and then between 1910 and 1940s, uh, primarily people thought that it was proteins and not the nucleic acids that were the genetic material. Their primary reason was that, well, humans or organisms are so complex, how can just four letters be responsible for it, right? Because at the end of the day, DNA was made with just four nucleotides and there were 20 amino acids. So they were like, wow, it has to be the amino acids. Can't be just the nucleotides. They didn't realize that with the four, you can still have a lot of options, right? Available to you. Oh, out of the way as I'm realizing this one over there. Okay, so um, this time now, you know, people were looking at, well, it's a protein, it's a DNA, how do we figure this out? So Griffith originally showed that heat killed bacteria can still transform living cells. Why would that be important in trying to figure out whether it's protein or DNA? If heat killed bacteria can transform living cells. Yes. Because proteins are denatured by heat. So if living cells are being made from them, that means that DNA. Something else is there. Yes, exactly. Good answer. Um, so yeah. So what he did was that he had these mice and he injected them with either a virulent strain of a bacteria of S. pneumoniae or a resistant uh, or, you know, a strain that was not going to cause any disease, a resistant strain. And so when they did the S strain, the mouse died. When they did the R strain, they lived, they were happy, they were going around. Then he went ahead and uh, heated uh, the S strain, so they should have been dead. And he injected and they were alive. But now he did something more interesting. He took those dead bacteria, he mixed them with the living R bacteria, and then he injected that mixture into the mice. And lo and behold, the mice died. So it wasn't that the dead bacteria were able to cause the death, but the dead bacteria was it were able to transform the non-virulent kind into the virulent kind and kill the mouse. So obviously there was something there that was heritable. And more importantly, when they looked at the dead mouse bloodstream, they found the living S bacteria in there. So something transformed them so that now they had the R, the living R were now the living S. And so that was the interesting portion there. Come on, you were working. Now you're not. Maybe I have to click back on the slide. I didn't have to work. Well, when it started to work, I didn't have to. Well, it wasn't doing it yet either. Then you have three different um, people. So, again, you know, remember in science, nothing is ever permanent truth, unless, you know, even after lots and lots of replication, it's always just a hypothesis that we are working on. When you have a lot of evidence towards it by multiple people with multiple model systems, you pretty much believe it to be the truth at that point, but there could always be another experiment, a mind, you know, blowing experiments, a completely changing, life-changing experiment that shows it to be wrong in a particular circumstance, in which case you'd be back to square one to reorganize it. But in this case, again, several people were working together, Avery, uh, McLeod, and McCarty, and they continued those experiments to study it further, to check out what it that converted the R to the S strain, and whether it was indeed the DNA. 
So what they did was they took S strain cells, they separated, they fractionated the cells. So they had just the RNA, just the protein, just the DNA, just the lipids, and just the carbs. So they pretty much took out specific portions in each test tube. Now they took each of these test tubes and they used them to transform the R strains to see what exactly did it, right? Because it didn't have to be DNA. It could have been any one of these agents for all we knew. And what happened was that only one of these fractions were able to convert the R to S strain, to the virulent strain. And those were the DNA. So this experiment, again, um, definitely gave more proof towards this, that the heritable transforming principle is DNA and not the proteins or the carbohydrates or the lipids or anything else. and Chase worked one step further and they now examined um, the, again, the DNA and they looked at, well, again, what is it on this DNA that is causing this change? What they did was they looked at E. coli um, cells and they infected them with these viruses, right? So these were viruses that could be uh, could infect the E. coli. And um, with them, some of these were labeled with the, their DNA, right? The DNA of the virus was labeled with P32. And in other cases, the proteins were labeled by using S35. So these are radioactive labels that are placed on top of the um, viral DNA or protein. And they mix those up and they allow the viruses to infect the E. coli. Then these E. coli would have uh, had the viral heads all stuck outside, right? The viral body stay inside, only the heritable agent is gonna go in. And they sheared the heads off the bacteria through centrifugation. And then they uh, are going to, uh, you know, centrifuge it, collect the bacteria, and look for what they find. And they could have found P32, which would indicate that it is DNA. Or they could have found S35, which would indicate that the heritable agent is protein. And in their case, they found that all the infected bacteria contain P32, but not S35. Again, a different experiment, right? Going to the same result. And that's very important to not just replicate the experiment exactly as is, but also look at it in a different way and see if you still get the same conclusion. It's very important in research to do it that way. Multiple ways all leading to the same answer. Um, so this again showed conclusively that it was the DNA that was infected, uh, infecting the bacteria. So that is what was the heritable trait within the system. So what exactly is DNA made of? Um, so this is this part is from that chapter two, right? You guys looked at some of it in that online lecture. The rest of it is, you know, you're going to have bits of it with each type. When I talk about proteins, I'll talk about amino acids uh, and so on and so forth. So what exactly is part of the DNA? Uh, DNA at, and RNA are nucleic acids. They basically contain nucleotides, right? The nucleotides are made up of a sugar, phosphate, and a base. So the nitrogen containing base um, is formed in two ways. You can have these two ring structures called purine or one ring structure called pyrimidines. The sugar also comes into flavors depending on whether it's DNA or RNA. For DNA specifically, it's gonna be deoxyribose. And for RNA, it's gonna be a ribose. It's a five carbon sugar. And then you have the phosphate side chain. That's part of the side chain. So phosphate and sugar make the backbone of your DNA. That's the big ladder. And then the actual strings of the ladder are made with the, new, uh, the bases within them. The bases, you have five different flavors. There are three different types of pyrimidines and two purines. The purines, you have adenine and guanine. Those are gonna be present in both DNA and RNA. And then in the pyrimidine, you have uracil, cytosine, and uh, kinine. 
In your DNA, you're gonna get cytosine and hymen. And in RNA, hymen is not gonna be present. Instead, you'll have uracil in there. So you'll have cytosine and uracil instead. Uh, so those are the basic components, building blocks of your DNA. A phosphate, sugar, backbone, and then appropriate bases to fill up inside. Um, so nomenclature-wise, uh, I would expect you to know the difference between a base and a nucleoside as opposed to a nucleotide. And uh, you should be able to read in the, if it is an essay question, what exactly it is that I'm talking about. Uh, a base is just that purine or pyrimidine that I'm talking about, right? Just the base itself. So those are going to be those five, adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, and thymine, right? Um, adenine and guanine are your purines. The others are your pyrimidines. Uh, these are their abbreviations, A, G, C, U, N, T, basically just the first letter. Um, the nucleoside is just that base combined with a sugar, with its appropriate sugar. Could be ribose, could be deoxyribose, doesn't matter. But when the base is already combined with the sugar in its appropriate location, it's called the nucleoside. When it is now also combined with the phosphate, then it is a nucleotide, okay? So that is the basic difference. It will become extremely important when we are talking about signaling molecules and they include these within them. So adenosine monophosphate, looking at that, you know adenosine, right? Um, so this is your base uh, adenine. It has the adenine in there. Monophosphate has one phosphate attached to it. Um, in the molecule, right? Deoxyadenosine monophosphate. Um, now you know that that adenosine is uh, combined with a deoxyribose versus a ribose, and then a monophosphate, again, single phosphate attached to it, right? So you should be able to read these and figure out what is attached. So diphosphate means two phosphates attached to them. Triphosphate means three phosphates attached to it. And this one you should all know about, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the energy molecule, right, uh, in our cells. The nucleotides, again, nucleotides means what? That it is the base combined with sugar and phosphate already. They are joined together with phosphodiester bonds, both in DNA and RNA. So the phosphodiester bonds uh, combines these, links these adjacent molecules to each other, okay? And this is with the three prime on one side, right? And the five prime on the next. So that's why you have your three prime and five prime ends in the DNA, because those are the two uh, location carbons that you are actually attaching when you are linking them together. So it's a three prime carbon, uh, third carbon, combining with the fifth carbon of the adjacent nucleotide. This, uh, these nucleotides can also act as short-term carriers for energy, as we all know, in the form of ATP and ADP. Um, ATP, again, has three phosphates. This third phosphate is a really high energy bond and really unstable. That's why that's the one that's broken up to get the energy released and that energy becomes available for your cellular work. Uh, now remember, because it was uh, adenosine, right? Um, it has the ribose attached to it, and then it has the three phosphates attached to it. When it breaks up, you now get uh, the remaining molecule is your uh, adenosine diphosphate. Uh, and then that little uh, phosphate that is that got separated is there for energy. It has to recombine with another phosphate to convert back to ATP and be available for further use. And that cycle goes on all the time, millions of times in each of our cells every second of every day. Um, so we will do this as the last slide, I think, maybe. Let me see what the rest Yes, and then we will start from the secondary structure next time.
So the nucleotides have many, many, many functions. They are not just an information storage system like we typically think about, right, with the DNA inside the nucleus. Information storage is a big portion of their work in the form of DNA and RNA. They are also chemical energy carrier in the form of ATP and GTP. Um, they can also combine with other groups, other proteins, other place, other uh, organ, uh, other fatty acid groups, other protein groups to create coenzymes. Uh, and so they have actual functional work inside the cells. These are coenzyme A is an example of that. And they can act as intracellular signaling molecules. An example of that is cyclic AMP. It is a very important uh, information carrier as well as a cellular um, signaling molecule that we will talk about when we talk about cell signaling in more in detail. So it is an important part of its function. So these four functions you should know and be able to differentiate when they would be used. Cool. So we'll pause here. I think that's a good stopping point, actually. And we will continue with secondary structure of DNA next week. Now, next time, we are also going to be doing our discussion group, our first discussion group, and uh, with that genome excerpt. There should be a PDF of that excerpt with just a few pages uh, from the book genome, from its introduction, that I would like you to read and be ready to discuss next time in class in your group. Um, so, yeah, you can sit here. There you go. That's your page. Up here. So, and then the curator. Oh, 